So, I'm a political anthropologist at SOAS, and I specialize in the study of organizations, specifically organizations that aim to do public good. So far, I've mainly studied international NGOs and parliaments. Within SOAS, I run something called the Global Research Network on Parliaments and People. And we've been giving scholars to and artists in Bangladesh and, and Myanmar and Ethiopia to study their own parliaments. And these projects are designed and led by those scholars um, in their own countries. And the results are truly outstanding. So you can see some of their research are on the web page that I've given you here on the title slide. Um, and I really recommend having a look because a lot of their work is, is truly extraordinarily talented. But I'm going to talk about my own research today. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, a growing trend, which is um, studying uh, institutions at home. As you know, traditionally, a lot of anthropologists used to go to other countries um, when they were doing their, their research. But quite often, anthropologists turn their attention uh, to home. And I'm particularly interested in these institutions of, of parliaments. And in Europe, um, the territory of parliamentary studies was very much dominated by historians, political scientists and legal scholars until quite recently. Um, Marco Biles was the first anthropologist to venture into European legislatures in, in France and then in the European Parliament. Um, and he was interesting because in contrast to political scientists, he really avoided kind of just looking at the institution as an abstract entity, producing lots of statistics and schemata and typologies and so forth. Um, he shone a light on aspects of parliaments that are really neglected, their history, their language, their rituals, their symbolism, uh, the imagination that's involved in doing politics and how these are all interconnected. So he, he really got into the entanglements that you find in, in parliaments and, and looked at contradictions um, rather than avoiding them. So I followed in his footsteps and went to the Westminster Parliament. And uh, I started by studying the House of Lords. So I was there intensely from about 98 to 2000 and then part time after that. And then I, I went and um, bravely went into the Commons. Um, which is a much, much more frantic place. So what did I do while I was there? Well, I did a, an immense mix of activities, and that is how anthropologists work. We never use one kind of method to try and understand what's going on in a place. So I'm not going to bore you by telling you all of these, except just to say that actually, although I did a huge number of formal interviews, over 350 so far and still, still counting, I actually learned more probably from the informal conversations, basically the gossip, you know, catching people after meetings and talking to them during during functions to find out what is really going on behind the scenes. But I also found out a huge amount by doing what I call kind of mini histories. Uh, so it's kind of case studies, but with a, with a kind of narrative form. And I'll tell you a little bit about one of those uh, in a moment. So I, 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 used a whole range of methods to try and understand what was what's really going on behind the scenes in, in the House of Lords and the House of Commons. So there's a brilliant anthropologist called Tim Ingold, who describes what it's like doing anthropology. He, he writes about how we're interested in philosophical questions, but we don't just stay at a really abstract level. We, we leave the people in. We're interested in, in everyday relationships and the ways that people make meanings in, in an everyday sense. Um, and so it's in a way, it's a bit like being a detective, except that we're trying to answer puzzles rather than to solve crimes. I look at various sites that politicians go to, because what I was interested in 
was to try and understand the nature of political work. So what do they actually do, politicians? We get a very strange view of them because we see them through the prism mainly of the television and, and the way they look uh, in Prime Minister's Question Time or when they're arguing with each other. That really represents a tiny, tiny fraction of what politicians actually do. So I went to all the different sites. I tried to get into political party conferences uh, and more difficult into their meetings. I visited constituencies. I watched them in select committees and, and so forth. So I, I really covered up the whole range of all the different sort of jobs that they do. And I realized that actually politicians are shapeshifters. They jump from different audiences, different expectations, different different pressures, um, and they have to literally shift their shape in order to adapt to the different kinds of work that they do. And this is very, very revealing about what anthropology is like, because I discovered this one day, not in a kind of cold, clinical, even way, but in a kind of revelation that I had when I was talking to a clerk in this, this is one of my uh, most uh, frequented fieldwork sites. This is a cafe in, in the House of Commons where it's very often MPs will, will meet visitors. And I was talking to a clerk and the clerks are the people who run parliament. They're extremely knowledgeable. So I was asking him to try and explain to me uh, about the work of uh, select committees. And an MP came up and he saw that I was wearing a parliamentary pass. So he assumed that I was a member of staff in the House of Commons. So he started joking with us and he started saying, oh gosh, he was warning to me. He said, oh, beware of this guy. He's really unstable. You know, you've really got to, got to watch out for him. And Tom, the guy I was talking to, kept trying to interrupt him and say, oh, can, I can I introduce you? And finally he said, can I introduce you to to Dr. Crew, who's from the University of London. She's writing a book about the House of Commons. And this MP shapeshifted in a second. He stood straight, he became very formal and serious. He shook my hand and he said, Dr. Crew, I'm delighted to meet you. If I can help you in any way, please just, uh, here's my business card. I said to Tom after this guy, what just happened? What, what is going on with that guy? And he said, yeah, that, that's what it's like for MPs. Every day they have to try and read their audience and work out what kind of relationship they're in because they're in such a dizzying kind of range of different relationships with different people. So they're continually having to adapt, jumping from one, one job to the next. So I wanted to tell you next something about, uh, in a little bit more depth, uh, two of the kinds of jobs that they're doing. One is about making law. And the other one is what they do in their constituency. So the lawmaking, I thought, right, I've read this lawmaking is absolutely core to the business, if you like, of, of parliament, to, to what it's actually trying to achieve. It's a legislature amongst other things. So, so how does law actually get made? Well, I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll follow law. I'll follow, and I chose one very um, small clause. It was 250 words in a bill about children and families. And it had come about because um, uh, when families break down, on average, 350,000 children don't get to see both parents um, on separation. And this is often the father because they tend to have, <clears throat> often don't have such a, a the main role as, as carers. So uh, a group sprung up, Fathers for Justice, um, and they were campaigning to have more time with their children on separation uh, because they thought that the courts were unfair to fathers. And this piece of law was trying to encourage the courts to say children should be involved with both parents. But to cut a long story short, I followed all the changes that were made in this little tiny piece of um, legislation. And I got particularly interested in the final one, which is expressed here in 2B. So this little bit of uh, this amendment, um, if you look at all the documents, so if you just kind of did a textual analysis, which is what lots of scholars do, then actually it looks as if this was made by 
a member of the House of Lords, a former um, family court judge. And uh, yes, indeed, she did stand up one day and put this amendment and it got passed. But that kind of covers over an incredibly complex, huge number of people who got involved in campaigning for this clause. In fact, it was originally written by a young woman called Hazel, a paralegal in a children's charity uh, in Bloomsbury. Uh, as she then put it to the Labour Party and they didn't manage to get through, but finally this, this court judge did because she stood up and said, you know, I'm above party politics. This is, this is evidence. And uh, sure enough, okay, but it was also a political campaign that took months and months and months. And my point is that if you look, if you just take a superficial look at the documents um, that lead up to a law uh, becoming approved by Parliament, you miss out all the engagement between politicians and, and civil society. And this is what anthropologists are about. They're, they really like looking at the depth of the relationships that go on kind of beneath, for example, a legal text. So the other area of work I really wanted to tell you about was MPs in their constituencies. This is a kind of mysterious world from the point of view of scholarship, because not that many academics have gone and really looked at what happens in constituencies. It's not very easy to find out because a lot of the meetings, particularly the meetings uh, which are called surgeries in, in, in the UK, as you probably know, um, are, are private. So you have to treat this with immense kind of delicacy. But I, I observed a lot of um, surgery meetings, I shadowed MPs, I talked to MPs and their staff, and I found out a few very interesting things. One was that they have a kind of encyclopedic knowledge of their constituency, of what's going on, the issues, the problems, the various charities, which are the efficient housing officers, um, all the different health clinics. They really know their constituency well, and in a way they act like and particularly um, when uh, we've had auster austerity for a number of, number of years, the problems caused by austerity really show up in, in constituencies. The other thing that really shows up are mental health issues. So in a recent uh, visit with um, a colleague who's a psychotherapist uh, and a group analyst, we listened to estimates by MP staff that possibly as many of half the people who present with problems in constituencies have some kind of mental health issue. So what's going and they're doing, these MP staff are trying to help those people without that much support themselves. Um, and finally about constituencies, another aspect which I found very interesting was that the, it was the women MPs who seemed rather more comfortable with this kind of work um, and although lots of men were also comfortable, it was only male MPs, a few of them, who delegated entirely to female caseworkers or looked a little bit uncomfortable at this very emotional kind of labour. And, and that is interesting. It needs a little bit of a bigger sample, but it would be interesting if, uh, and a familiar pattern, if it is the case that women, women MPs across the country are doing this much more hidden, very emotionally difficult labour because it, it, it does mean that they have less time to be kind of uh, working in Parliament and uh, improving their position within the party so that they can get a, a position in government or on the opposition front bench. So that's just to give you a little flavour of some of the work that goes on in, in Parliament and in the constituencies. To return to the question of what it feels more generally like to be an MP, um, I was very struck by the, the stress that they experience themselves. And um, I think it's partly because they're juggling these multiple roles, they're having to shape shift, they're having to adapt to all these different pressures. They can't please all their, whatever it is, um, between 50 and 100,000 uh, constituents. Um, the, the constituents are very, are very uneven. And one described it at, at being MP as feeling like um, you're on the receiving end of Geng Genghis Khan's preferred form of torture, which is when you have uh, for each limb 
being tied to a horse and the horse being told to, to pull. And it, it can be a very lonely kind of job. Addictive, yes, but, but lonely. And so this raised another puzzle for me, which was, so how do these MPs cope? How do they cope with this endless changing and fracturing and, and pressure and exposure on, on social media and so forth? Some don't. Alcoholism and divorce are pretty high amongst uh, MPs, um, but many do. And many really, really keep going back. They keep standing to be uh, MPs and they do stay relatively sane. So my question is, how do they how do they do this? How do they create some kind of stability uh, in their work? And I had kind of three processes which I identified as processes which create some continuity across MPs work and, and potentially some some stability. So the first kind of continuity uh, for MPs is what I've called rifts. You could you could think of these as little kind of nuggets of ideology or or ideas or or values or beliefs or whatever. So um, MPs have to develop rifts as individuals, as factions within their party, uh, as political parties, and you need to improvise them for different audiences. So we think of MPs as very inauthentic and changeable, but actually they can be quite repetitive, actually, because um, if I give an example of uh, Chris Bryant, Labour MP, told me that when he was uh, having to be uh, an expert on pensions, he developed uh, a riff about pensions, which was possible to use for all kinds of different audiences. He had a 90 second version, a five minute version, a, a 20 minute version and, and so forth. And um, these these riffs are what politicians have to use to try and persuade people uh, to give them support for the causes um, that they mind about. The second way that they create some kind of continuity in their work is through rhythms. So again, there are similarities between all MPs. Uh, so all MPs pretty much go to Prime Minister's Question Time at the same time every week when the Parliament's sitting on a Wednesday. And then there are other rhythms which are organise MPs by party, so they tend to go to their annual party conferences, for example. But there are still more rhythms which are idiosyncratic to each MP. And MPs will be very influenced by whether they've got a background in social work, or whether they're more interested in business or whatever. But but I think we need to know more about the rhythms of, of MPs and how they vary, including our own. So it's an understudied area. And finally, rituals are really, really important in Parliament. Uh, and we think of rituals as something that happens in religion, but actually they're vital in both political worlds and in the legal world. We really need them. So if you're, you've got a very important decision being made, for example, by a judge in a court or by politicians about, say, Brexit, then you need to have rigid rules and to be able to witness that people are sticking by the rules for people to consent to the decisions that are made. We would have anarchy without uh, rituals, but they're also interesting for researchers because the more things are ritualized, the more that it reveals that there is a politically significant event going on. So they're also very useful as research tools. And this is partly why anthropologists really are very interested in them. So to conclude, politicians are like us, but they're also not like us. So they're, they're like us because actually we're all shapeshifters to some extent. We're different with our families. We're different in our workplace. We're different if we're um, going into um, holiday. We, we, we shapeshift in the sense that we're continually adjusting to different places and times and audiences. But what's interesting about politicians, I think, is that because they're so exposed, they, they are connected to thousands and thousands of people, partly in their constituency, but also uh, to those who are interested in their causes. So partly because they're exposed, partly because they're very ambitious, um, and partly uh, because they're in competition with each other, 
um, they are shapeshifters in a way that the dial is turned up. So we're all similar in the sense that we have to make adaptations, but they do so in a way that's magnified and amplified. So politicians are like us, but with the dial turned up. And I think this is partly uh, why we don't like them. They kind of remind us of the worst of ourselves. But actually, we should really put that dislike to one side because to engage with politics, we have to find allies amongst politicians. Um, and we need to distinguish between government, which rules us and creates chaos very often, and, and the bits of parliament that are holding government to account and uh, the bits of parliament that are about us being represented as citizens. So I think we need to understand more about politics, but we also need to do politics ourselves in order to make um, democracy work. 